Well, thank you very much, Sarah and Obadiah. That was beautiful. Before the readings are read, I'm going to introduce the readings because, in particular, the first one is from one of the more difficult books to read in our entire Bible, the book of Revelation. It's full of symbolism, and some of the symbolism is quite bizarre and sometimes even grotesque. So I'm going to borrow some sermon time and I'm going to introduce the reading, then Sue will do the readings, and then I'll briefly comment on them. So what you're not getting is two sermons, but two half sermons. How does that sound? <laughs> Great. Now, Revelation, according to one very respected commentator, is a strange mixture of visions, symbolism, cryptic numbers, apoplectic jargon and Old Testament allusions. There are sublime glimpses of Jesus in heavenly glory, the hope of future reward is held out to the faithful, and in later chapters of the book we find a word picture of a scene the author saw in his vision, a glimpse of the supreme majesty and overpowering splendour of Almighty God enthroned in heaven. Now, here's its historic setting. The first century AD, the Roman Empire was ruled by, at times by very competent people and at other times by people who were completely bonkers. <laughs> and including two of the bonkers ones, Nero, Caligula. It was plagued by internal power struggles and in fact, in one year, there were four emperors. So, as you could see, there were some real power struggles. In a, a civil war resulted, and a very powerful general called Vespasian emerged as the emperor of Rome. Now, Vespasian, having seized power during, with a military coup, he needed something to unify the empire he had taken over. So he introduced something called emperor worship, which isn't a bad way of uni unifying an emperor, is it? Or uni unifying an empire. Emperor worship. He decreed that everyone in the empire should worship him as the boss as the emperor. Quite bizarre in our view, but it was a way of unifying the emperor, empire, which was very disjointed, obviously. They'd had civil war. Now his son, Vespasian, took it to an even greater, he raised the bar even greater, decreeing that anybody, every citizen in his <coughs> empire should go before a magistrate once a year and pledge allegiance to the emperor and say, Caesar is Lord, every citizen. Now, there were some citizens who couldn't do that. And those citizens, of course, were the Christians. The Christians, yes, the Christians. They couldn't do that. Because how do you go and say a man is Lord when you've pledged that Jesus is Lord? So it became very difficult. Christians were persecuted. There was wholesale persecution of Christians. Some were put to death. And at this time, at this terrible time, it, when Christianity was crumbling, a Christian leader, whose name we know was John, was exiled to an island, a penal colony called Patmos in the Mediterranean. He was exiled there. And from there, he wrote to the churches with which he was identified all around Ephesus in today modern Turkey. He wrote to them a letter, a letter of encouragement, a letter saying, hey guys, hang in there. He was holding out the hope of, of, of glory, of future glory for those who kept the faith. 
and he was trying to strengthen those who were wavering, he wrote that letter. And that letter is today preserved for us in our Bible as the book of Revelation. So this happened during those troubled times and there were messages to each of the seven churches with which he was associated and we're going to today have part of that read to us by my friend and colleague Sue who reads beautifully. Would you please, Sue? The first reading is from Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. All of the three readings for this morning are printed in your bulletin from the NRSV version. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and on his account all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. <clears throat> I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother, who shares with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom and the patient endurance, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. The actual messages of these churches is too long to read now, so Ian will praise this later. However, something special was relayed to the Christian church in Laodicea, which I will read to you now. This is taken from Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea, write, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And lastly, I read verse 20 of the same chapter 3, which is our theme scripture for this morning. Listen, I am standing at the door, knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you, and you with me. And now a very brief reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 24 and 25, another theme scripture recording a teaching of Jesus addressed to his disciple band after he had related the parable of the sower to a large crowd. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given to you. For those who have, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Sue. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
Give your servant grace that he may speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes, the seven churches to whom John addressed his letter were all in today's Turkey, in Asia Minor. And the essential message he was giving was that hold fast, be encouraged. Everything, everything is in God's hands. And ultimately, God is in control. And like one of those Old Testament prophets that we read about, he has the message which says, hold on, keep the faith, and don't waver. And he has this big stick that he waves saying, because when Jesus comes, he mustn't find you wanting. It's a uh, quite an interesting read. I guess there are many people who've started to read Revelation and have given up. Is that not so? Okay, come on, confess. How many people have given up reading Revelation? I did when I first read it. But then I had to read it, of course, and persevere to the end. And I found that in Revelation there was so much good stuff mixed in there amongst all the other rather bizarre bits and pieces. And here we have, and I'm going to read something to you. Remember this passage was communicated to a church fighting for its life. So the seer John paints a word picture of a scene that he's been privileged to glimpse. The serene majesty and overpowering splendor of Almighty God enthroned in heaven. And a respected commentator writes, like so much else in this book, the language isn't descriptive, but it's impressionistic. Words can only hint at what in human terms is indescribable. Here, we're in the realm of poet, painter, composer, not historian or scientist, depicted in words the sovereign creator receiving the honor which is his due. I guess those of you that are interested in art know what impression, impressionistic means. You know, you go and have a look at a Monet painting, for example, and, and it's as he, the impression that it gives on him that is conveyed. You go and have a look at a one by John Constable and you have a look at a landscape and it's the landscape as he sees it. But this revelation is impressionistic. It's, you've got to take that in order to understand what it is, what, what it means. And you also have to take the setting in which it's written to really understand that here was a church fighting for its life. So each of the seven churches that the writer was associated with, gets a message. Now, first message to the one in Ephesus. Ephesus was where St. Paul spent three very productive years in ministry. But now, 30 years after that, it seems that its members are lacking in enthusiasm and they get uh, a big serve for that. And then, there's another church which says its members are too ready to compromise. And then there's yet another that's too tolerant of outside influences. And another is deemed spiritually dead. Anybody from Philadelphia? Because <laughs> that's the only one that gets anything good said about it. Philadelphia, the church at Philadelphia. Not your Philadelphia, of course, this is... Philadelphia near Ephesus. Now the Christian church in Laodicea is described as lukewarm because of their indifference. And I guess despite it being described as lukewarm, there is to them painted one of the most beautiful 
pictures, I believe, of Jesus in the entire scriptures. And it's the picture that's on your bulletin. The picture of Jesus knocking at the door as we played out with my friend and I this morning, as we played out of Jesus knocking at the door of the human heart, seeking to come in. Now let me tell you a story against myself. When I was a young fellow, I've got a great, great credential for being a preacher because when I was a young fellow, I was a commercial fisherman. How about that? Good credential? Better than being a helicopter pilot, Randy. I was a commercial fisherman. Came home from sea one time. I thought, mugs game in North Atlantic, getting swilled about by the ocean. But there's got to be something better. My ship had been smashed up. It was being repaired. So there I looked at the newspaper and it said, sales representative wanted. I thought, that's a cushy job. That's a great job, sales representative. Good salary, good this, good that, good the other. I applied, what it was, knocking on doors, selling encyclopedias. <laughs> I was introduced to my sales supervisor, a man called Huckabee, very dapper gentleman with a moustache and a very dandy dress. Absolutely fantastic. And out we went into a housing estate to go knocking on some doors. Stand at the door and knock, right? Get it? Get the connection? Within space of maybe two hours, I'd learnt enough from Mr. Huckabee to go out on my own. He set me loose on my own, and I'd been given a, a, a little screed that said, standard answers to sales objections. I had that in my bag next to the bit that I was to show the customer. First house, knocked on the door, pulled it out, out the standard answers to sales objection. Customer picks it up, hands it to me and said, you're going to need that, son. <laughs> I went to the next house. <laughs> next house I went to, knocked on the door, very nice lady, opened the door, invited me in, had a cup of tea, talked to her, talked to her kids, and I walked out there with a sale. And you know what? It was equal to the day's wage of a tradesman in those days. And I'd been on the job half an hour. How about that? I thought, whoa, going to see the mugs game. This is great. This is fabulous. Went home, told my mother all about it. She was overjoyed. Her son wasn't going to go out there and get swilled around by the Atlantic rollers anymore. Next day I went out. I knocked on doors and doors and doors and doors. I never got a chance to even tell anybody about these wonderful encyclopedias I was selling because they were watching TV or they were, and they looked at me, some people, some even slammed a door in my face and they looked at me like I was one of those things, you know, you carry around in a bag after your dog. I mean, it was dreadful. It was, a, it was dreadful. So here was me as a door knocker. Now, you've got to remember this story, this story, this description of Jesus as knocking on the door of human hearts is absolutely astonishing. And getting all the knockbacks that happens when somebody goes knocking on the door. How many times you've been having your dinner, now they don't knock on your door, they, re they call your phone, right? And you're just having your dinner and it says, well, good morning, Mrs. Uh, you know, good morning, Ian. Oh, yes, uh, like they've known you all your life. You, you, you've had a, oh, don't tell me you've never had one of those calls. <laughs> I don't believe it. Well, that's how it is now. But, you know, in the old days, it was door knocking, door knocking, door knocking, door knocking. Door knocking is tough. And that, my friends, is what our Christ does for us. Knocks on our doors. That is, to me, the most astonishing story. A Jewish scholar remarked, and I go back to my quotes again, he said, the one thing in the world which no Jewish prophet or rabbi ever conceived is the concept of a God actually going out in quest of sinful men who've turned away from him. Now, the King James version of this story 
has, to me, one of the most beautiful phrases in Scripture. And it says that those who open the door to the Christ, he will come in and sup with him. And the Greek word that is used for sup isn't supper as little bite before you go to bed. It's not a snack or something like that. The Greek word means the evening meal. So it, what is this promise? It's saying that the Christ will go in and be part of somebody. He will dwell with somebody. As in that him abide with me, you know, fast falls the even side, he will come in and he will be with them. It's the most astonishing promise, this one. The big event. There was no TV in those days. There was no quick snack. There was no Xbox in those days. I'd forgotten about Xbox till someone reminded me of it today. But in those days, the evening meal was a big event, an event where people got together, where people communed, where people bonded. And that's what Jesus is saying in that, saying that he will come in and he will be that to people who let him into their hearts. Christ knocks and men can decide whether they let him in or not. The only thing is, the door handle's on the inside. It's up to us. Remember the story of the Emmaus Road? Fabulous story. Jesus meets those two disciples coming along the road. They don't know who he is. And eventide, and it's the song, Abide With Me, and he doesn't force himself upon them. He doesn't say, hey, I'm coming in to, have, to be with you guys. He waits patiently until they ask him to come in and be with him. And you know, it's incredible because for them, I guess, it was never, life was never the same. So Christ might plead. Now I'm going to link this reading from Revelation to that little reading from the Gospel. I would like to have on every pulpit, not some flowers like that, they're beautiful, but I would like to have on every pulpit what Jesus told those disciples of his after he'd related the parable of the sower. Take heed what you hear, for the measure you give will be the measure you receive. I'd like that on every pulpit because, my friends, it's a two-way deal. It's a two-way deal. It's not just, but it's, you've got to give of yourself in order to get, in order to receive the blessings of belief. Now, I'll tell you one last story. When I was in the full-time ministry of the church, one of my congregations, there was a man called Cyril. Cyril was an Air Force officer. He was a very clever man, very good man, wonderful father. He came along every Sunday morning and he brought his kids to church, he and his wife. They were lovely folk. They were folk, let me give him the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate praise. He was people like you. <laughs> he was wonderful. Well now Cyril, one, one Sunday morning I was preaching on that very text about take heed what you hear for the measure you give will be the measure you receive. And Cyril, uh, just before the service began, a, a lady who was in our congregation came to me and said, this is my friend, and the friend was blind. And she said, this is my friend who's been blind from birth, and she loves to sing in church. Would you please allow her to sing in your service I said oh please 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 we didn't have wonderful musicians like Sarah and Obadiah you know it was a little country church she stood up and she sang what a friend we have in Jesus and I gotta tell you the atmosphere in that church was electric charged but it wasn't electricity my friends it was the Holy Spirit that took over this congregation as this 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 beauty shone from this lady's sightless eyes. 
When I shook hands at the door, Cyril shook my hand and there were tears running down his face. He had been moved. He had opened the door and he said to me, Ian, my life will never be the same again. He said, because I have let Christ into my heart. Amen.